A huge deposit of dinosaur fossils has just been discovered. And now, you and up to four other intrepid paleontologists are competing to dig up the most impressive stuff. Fossilus by Kids Table Board Gaming. Set aside one of each of the three different types of sand tiles, amber, egg, and footprint, to form three separate discard piles. Then take all the bones and hammers and do your best to sprinkle them evenly throughout the dig site without paying too much attention to where everything ends up. Then put the lid on top of the dig site and pick it up, holding the lid tightly in place and gently shake it around to move things inside a little more randomly. The rulebook suggests using mostly up and down motions to avoid bunching everything in one corner. Slide the site map into place under the lid, then remove the lid and put it back in the box. Then build up the terrain with the help of all the other players to speed setup along, according to the following rules. The bottom layer consists of only four gray stone tiles, and only on the four spaces marked with an X. Every other space must be either brown clay or yellow sand. Finish the bottom layer before starting on the top. On the top layer, any tile can be placed anywhere except in the four corner spaces, and stone cannot be stacked on top of stone. Only ten tiles will be placed on the top layer. Once the tiles are placed, insert the blocker between two of the side posts, hold it down tight, and use it to keep the tiles where they are while you slide out the site map. Then, flip the site map onto the score tracker side, the blocker onto the player aid side, and set them both near the dig site where everyone can reach them. Draw nine random skill tokens to place face up on the skill display, returning extras to the box. If you're not into players being openly aggressive toward each other, you can replace any skill tokens with the little blue frowny face on them. Shuffle the events deck, draw three cards, and stack them face down on the event space without looking at them. The rest can go back to the box. Make a supply pile of all 40 of the plaster cubes. Then move four cubes for each player on top of the event stack to form what's called the plaster pool. Keep the supply and the pool separate from each other, and keep the tweezers handy. Shuffle the dinosaur deck, deal four cards face up to the dinosaur display, and leave the rest in a face down draw pile nearby. Shuffle the tools and supplies deck separately, deal two cards from each face up to the market display, and leave the rest of each deck in face down draw piles. Give each player a player mat and matching paleontologist meeple, and put each player's score token next to the score track. Decide who's going to go first, give them the first player token, and in reverse player order, each of you will place your meeple on an empty corner of the dig site. In a five-player game, the center tile of the site is also available. Your turn consists of three steps. Most actions only cost one energy, but there are a couple that cost more. Every turn, you start with four energy, and you can use it to take actions in any combination, any order, any number of times, as long as you still have the energy to spend. The player aid has a quick reference of them all, but we'll go over them here, too. Take one plaster from the pool and put it on the storage area of your mat. If the pool ever runs out, it triggers an event, which will eventually lead to the end of the game, but we'll talk about that later. If you're ever supposed to gain plaster once the pool is already empty, you can take it from the supply instead. Move your meeple up to two spaces in any direction, including diagonal. You can move through a space that's occupied by another player, but you can't stop there and you can move up or down levels at no additional cost. If your meeple gets pushed off the edge of the dig site, you can spend one energy on your turn to put it back on any tile on the same edge you fell off. If there are no tiles there, you'll have to place a sand tile first, which is another action. When you take it, you can choose any sand tile you want from any of the three discard piles and place it anywhere on the dig site, as long as it doesn't create a stack any higher than two. And if your meeple's not on the dig site, your only choice here is to put the sand tile on the edge it fell off. Slide one tile that's orthogonally adjacent, meaning left, right, forward, or backward, but not diagonal, one space in any direction. The heavier the tile, the more energy this action costs. You can only do this with the top tile in a stack, but when you slide it, it can push any number of other tiles along with it too, 
as long as there are no tiles on top of them, and as long as none of them are heavier than this one. So, if you're sliding a stone tile, it can push anything, a clay tile can push clay or sand, and a sand tile can only push sand. If any tiles fall off the dig site while you're doing this, you get to claim them, which gives you fragments you'll be able to spend on stuff at the market later. We've already talked about what happens if a meeple falls off, but other things can happen to them in the process of sliding tiles around too. If a top layer tile pushes a meeple on the bottom layer, they simply move to the next adjacent space. If that space has a tile on the top layer, the meeple jumps up there, it doesn't get squished. If the meeple is pushed into an open pit where there is no tile, its owner fishes it out and puts it next to the board on any side they choose, as if they fell off. If a meeple is pushed into a space occupied by another meeple, the second one is pushed ahead to the next adjacent space. If your meeple is orthogonally adjacent to a pit, you may spend one energy and the appropriate amount of plaster cubes to extract a hammer or bone from that pit using the tweezers. Any plaster you spend goes to the supply, not back to the pool. Bones you extract go into the storage on your player mat, where you can save them for later or freely assign them to the dinosaur card in your lab. Once a bone has been assigned to a dinosaur, it can never be removed. If you extract a hammer, immediately trade it for one of the skill tokens available on the skill display. Put that token in the leftmost of the three skill spaces on your mat. When you cover up the shield symbol on the second and third spaces, that means you won't be scoring those victory points at the end of the game, so make sure the skills are really worth it. And note that since hammers are cheap and don't cost any plaster, you're only allowed to extract one of them per turn. Once you've finished taking whatever actions you're going to take on your turn, you have the option of spending fragments you've earned on one of the available tool or supplies cards in the market. The fragment cost for each card is at the bottom, and if you have to overpay because of how the fragments are split up on your tiles, you don't get any change back. Replace the card you buy with a new one from the corresponding deck. Supplies cards will award you with some combination of plaster, bones, and victory points. If a supplies card gives you plaster, take it from the pool right away. Then flip the card face down unless it gives you a bone. In that case, keep it face up beside your mat and treat it as if it were any other bone in your storage. Or if there happens to be a matching bone in the discard pile, take that and flip the card face down. Tools cards are action cards you can use during the action step on future turns. You can't use it on the turn you acquire it because the action step's already over by that point. Using tools doesn't cost any energy, and if they allow you to slide or remove tiles, you don't have to be adjacent to the tile in question. There's no limit to the number of tools you can hold on to. Once you've used a tool, flip it face down. And, at the end of the game, you'll score the number printed on the shield on each of your tools, whether you ever use its action or not. After you've done any market shopping you're going to do for this turn, if you don't already have a dinosaur card in your lab, and you have at least one of the bones required for one of the dinosaurs in the display, you can claim that dinosaur by bringing it into your lab. Then, replace the one you claimed with a new one from the deck. As soon as you claim a dinosaur, you have to assign at least one bone from your storage to that dinosaur by placing it on the card. You can only ever have one dinosaur in your lab at a time. If you already have one when you want to claim a new one, you'll have to score the one you have first. This can happen at any time during your turn. If the dinosaur you're scoring is in your lab and you have all of its required bones, you gain the amount of points shown in the perfect score shield here. If you don't have all the bones for the dinosaur in your lab, you can still cash out for a partial score, where you only gain the number of points indicated for each of the individual bones you've assigned to it. And if you happen to have all the required bones for one of the dinosaurs in the display sitting in your storage, you can skip bringing it to your lab and claim that perfect score right away. Advance your score token to keep track of how many points you've earned, flip the card you've scored face down in front of you, and discard any bones you used in the process. Once the plaster pool is depleted, you'll trigger an event. The active player takes the top card of the event deck without looking at it. 
Then, at the end of their turn, they'll reveal the card and carry out its instructions. After you've finished resolving it, move four plaster per player from the supply to the pool. Since there are three events, that means you'll go through four full pools before the game ends. Once that fourth pool runs out of plaster, keep going until everyone's had an equal amount of turns, using that first player token as a reference, then everyone takes one last turn before moving on to final scoring. If you've still got a dinosaur in your lab at this point, score it now for whatever you can get. If you have any empty skill slots, add points based on whatever number or numbers are still visible. If any of your skills award points, make sure you take credit for those, too. If you have any bones left over, they're worth a handful of victory points as well, as indicated on your player mat. Note that skulls aren't used by any of the dinosaurs, so if you pick any of those up, you'll only be using them at this stage of the game. For every two plaster you've got left, gain one victory point. Add points for any applicable tool and supplies cards you bought. Then comes the set collection aspect. Each dinosaur has three characteristics, indicated by icons on the top left of the card. If you have at least three dinosaurs that share the same characteristic, you'll score that characteristic's bonus according to the chart on your player mat. If you have at least one of all nine possible characteristics, you'll get an additional 12 points. Lastly, go around the table and see who has the most of each characteristic. For every one where there's a single leader, that player scores another three points. If there's a tie for the most, nobody gets anything. With all scores tallied, whoever has the most points is the winner. And that's how you play Fossilus. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like that, be sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and most importantly, go on over to twitch.tv slash BNB Tabletop and give us a follow there. We play board games live every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time on a show we call The Board and Barrel. And it's a very interactive broadcast. We have house rules that you guys can influence throughout the course of the game. Virtual bingo. You can bet on who's going to win. It's a lot of fun. And I look forward to seeing you there.